I will briefly introduce you, uh, Nick. Um, uh, Nick Jepson, we are happy to introduce, uh, has a background in global studies, um, in Freiburg Global Studies program, and the Freiburg program had also uh, education in South Africa, in Natal, uh, at, in Durban, and at JNU in Delhi. So that immediately gives you a wider orientation uh, if you work in that kind of setting and has done a PhD with Jeffrey Henderson, Global Political Economy, Bristol University, and is now Global Development Institute, University of Manchester, with some very interesting colleagues who've done critical work on, on development studies. And the kind of work he represents is, we could say it's part of Kaplinsky's Asian drivers, um, other people who worked on the east-south turn. Um, so it's a very interesting approach um, examining how 15 different developing countries have processed the China-driven, maybe Asia-driven commodities boom. Nick, please, we are happy to see you. Welcome. Thank you very much, Jan. And, and I, I really do appreciate the invitation and, and to Brett for, for organizing this. Um, you know, I mean, with all these Zoom things, we say, I wish I could be there in person. I mean, I, I think particularly sitting in very rainy Northern England, I'd look quite like to be in Southern California at the moment, honestly. But uh, I, I also, uh, I'd very much like to go back to Santa Barbara because uh, I, I was actually there while I was a grad student at Bristol, at least seven years ago now, unbelievably. But uh, uh, yeah, I did a, a sort of visit and scholarship thing for about uh, about four or five months and uh, did one of these talks, in fact, then, which I think is, in fact, where we met, isn't it? You know, you were, yes, uh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You told me I had far too many slides, so I've tried to uh, put down on those for tonight, but let's see. All right, so I'll, I will share my uh, slides. Tell me if this is uh, working. Is that OK? It's OK. Let me see that. All right, so how, how long do I have? About, what, 45 minutes or so, or 40 minutes? Or... Yes, that's fine. OK. I mean, since there's fewer of us, uh, I guess we could do this a bit more informally if you want. So if you want to interrupt me, then feel free. Um, and I guess we'll just see see how we go. If you've got questions, you can either save them to the end or if you do want to stop me, that's fine. Right, so this is all around a book that I wrote that came out with Columbia um, last year, uh, been out about exactly a year now, called In China's Way. And as Jan said, it's really about the um, impact of the uh, global commodity boom of um, roughly about 2003 to 2014 and the sort of implications of that for various countries in the global south commodity exporters but i am not going to start in this is going to work yeah i'm not going to start in china i'm going to start somewhere very different which this is buenos aires and um Way back in the midst of time when I was an undergrad, I actually did an exchange here at the Uber at, uh, in Buenos Aires. And that was 2001, 2002, which if anybody knows anything about Argentina, they'll know that that's a pretty sort of momentous time in Argentinian history. Um, this is kind of the, the culmination of uh, probably the worst sort of um, economic depression in their history uh, that you you. Uh, culminate in a situation where um, mass unemployment, huge austerity program, uh, movement of the unemployed that are regularly uh, rioting, and you know, this is one of those riots there, police crackdowns, there are bombs going off in banks, um, all this sort of stuff, and eventually the, the government does fall, the, uh, the, the president leaves in a, in a helicopter uh, from the presidential palace. Um, but this is really the reason I include it is because in a sense it's the intellectual genesis of, of the book because it's when I first started getting interested in questions of political economy and questions of um, development, I suppose, but also trying to figure out 
how it was that you have this country that um, uh, is instituting all these policies, austerity, privatization, deregulation, rather similar to what's happening in Greece, for example, in, in, in sort of 2015 or, or so, something like that. And a bit like in Greece, these policies have very, very little popular support. And, um, you know, and this is nominally at least a democracy. So what is happening here? How is it that um, these policies, which barely anybody would have voted for, are nevertheless being instituted? And, you know, there's lots been written about this over the years. Uh, and coming down to that phrase that Margaret Thatcher used to say, Tina, there is no alternative to this economic model, essentially. And I began to wonder whether that was really true. And if so, why not? Uh, why wasn't there an alternative? And what might the alternative look like? And how might they uh, happen? Um, and then around the middle of that decade, a few years later, some of these alternatives seem to be emerging in various places in the global south. So especially in Latin America, in Argentina itself, you have the, the two Kirchners, uh, you know, there you've got uh, Bolivia, you've got Ecuador, these sort of pink tide left and center left governments of various kinds in, in Latin America. I'm not going to get into detail at the moment. Um, but then you also have other things that seem to be experiments that seem to be varying from this, um, let's say, neoliberal or um, liberal orthodox uh, economics that sort of model. Uh, in places like Angola and places like Kazakhstan that actually look, look rather different. So began to think about, well, is there a connection between these things? And well, the most obvious thing is that they seem to be happening in countries which are uh, commodity exporters. So commodities, I essentially mean things that you dig up out of the ground or things that grow in the ground. But my main focus really uh, was on um, metals and on energy so things like fossil fuels but also things like copper uh, or um, zinc or iron ore these sorts of things and what you do notice at this period where these alternatives seem to be emerging is that exactly around the same sort of time you get this historic boom in uh, commodity prices and uh, roughly within that red rectangle there so again about 2002, 2003, till maybe 2013, 2014, with a bit of a dip in the middle, which coincides with the 2008, 2009 global financial uh, crisis. And, but this and, is- And Nick, Nick may, mm -hmm. I, may I add one point or is, see, here is another peak that is in the period 1970, 78. So that, 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 that is another key moment, right? Yeah, absolutely. So you've got these two booms that have circled here. So not so much uh, concentrating on agriculture here, because as you can see, in real terms, at least, you know, there is a, a boom in prices around this, this early 21st century period, but it's not historic art high. Um, whereas for uh, metals, uh, which is this green circle here, the, the previous highs come in kind of the 1960s. And then for energy, so for oil, you get a big jump in the early 1970s. So that's the first oil crisis the, the, uh, in the uh, wake of the uh, arms embargo and the um, Arab-Israeli war. And then 79, yes, that's absolutely right. So that's around the Iranian revolution and a, a second sort of boom in, in oil prices there. But what's kind of unique about the period uh, of that I'm looking at early 21st century is that all these commodities pretty much move um, all together. And that's that's not really happened before, but also it's a bigger and longer boom than any of these previous ones as well. Um, so the question is, well, what's happening there? Because it, it seems to be out of line with what's happening in the traditional drivers of the global economy. Um, and to go through the kind of basic argument here, uh, which I'll then sketch out in more, more detail. I think the answer to this, and I know Jan has a uh, slight disagreement with me here on this, but we could talk about it, is the answer is, is China. The, the third big phenomenon here that is, is not directly causing, but underlays these other things as sort of second and third order effects is 
uh, the continuing resource intensive growth of the Chinese economy, um, but particularly an infla inflection point because China has been growing very, very rapidly for a long time, of course, um, way back to the beginning of the reform period in the uh, late 1970s. Um, but what happens uh, around the early 2000s is that there is a shift where the Chinese economy uh, is consuming so many resources that it moves from being a net export of any of these uh, commodities to a net importer of them. Um, so for a very long time, uh, China's a oil exporter. Many people don't realize, uh, you know, China is one of the top five oil producers in the world. Um, I think it's the number three copper producer. Uh, you know, lots and lots of, of resources that are there and previously were being exported. Um, but you have this um, uh, shift where suddenly there is an appetite for commodity imports, which grows and grows and grows over um, this period. Um, and I'll get into the empirical case of this a little bit in a second. But to sketch it out, I, I argue that that's what's driving this unprecedented boom in prices. Um, but that crucially, and the connection with the kind of uh, uh, turn away from um, neoliberalism in these commodity exporting countries, I think the mechanism is, is like this, essentially that this uh, boom in uh, oil and copper and gas and whatever prices provides a new stream of revenue that's crucially independent of the international financial institutions, so the IMF, the World Bank, et cetera, independent of capital markets um, and of donors as well. Um, so in, in poorer countries, very often a uh, major revenue stream would have come, come from overseas development aid, for example, and that comes with its own conditions, just as a loan with the, for the IMF does. Um, and so the capacity for those three um, kind of uh, partners, I guess, or forms of partner to constrain to discipline policy choice within recipient states is very much lessened by this quantity group, a relatively simple idea. And it's not just because the price of a barrel of oil is going up and therefore there's the new revenue from that, um, but it also means a shift in bargaining power between resource rich states and uh, mobile um, capital. Uh, it is easier to sustain investment in your resource-based economy while prices in oil, for example, are, are still high. And the argument is that some of these countries, but by no means all of them, take advantage of these extremely um, positive um, conditions. Um, you know, you phrase it in old dependency theory terms as this is a shift in the circumstances of insertion of these countries into in, into the global political economy and a positive one for them um, that improves their sovereignty and autonomy over these, these, these matters. So some of them take advantage to break with liberal orthodox, uh, liberal economic orthodoxy. Uh, and my argument is at least for countries that were highly indebted uh, at the beginning of um, this period um, wouldn't have happened otherwise. And the book I talk about the case of Jamaica as a counterfactual for this, I won't talk about that now, but if anybody wants to ask about it at the end, you can do. Um, and that, you know, to zoom out from this, I think that, you know, the, the broader significance of this is not just that period, but that it, it sort of points to the impact that a rising China is having on bending and warping the sort of structures of the global political economy, the structures of capitalism, if you like. I mean, I think I talk about it quite a lot in terms of a growing gravitational pull as China becomes larger and larger within the global economy. That can't help um, but have this effect of pulling more uh, circuits of capital into its orbit and influencing them to a um, greater degree. And I suppose this is signaling, well, this is maybe the most obvious example of that happening so far. But what happens in the future, you know, and sort of pointing to this idea that there's a great deal written, and in fact, I'm writing some of this myself at the moment, about the, in, the direct impacts of China. So Chinese loans in various countries, or, you know, what is the impact of Chinese labor? What is the impact of Chinese investments, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that perhaps in some ways, the indirect consequences, so 
the impact of China on the global political economy, and then how that um, differentially uh, perhaps constrains or loosens constraints for different parts of, of the globe um, seems to me extremely important to be looking at. And this seems like the book, in a sense, is a case study of one of those processes. Okay, so indeed the first part, now I'm going to be brief about this, but to demonstrate what I mean by China as the kind of main driver here, the, the gravitational pull. So I, I think, you know, we all pro probably know by now about, you know, the, the kind of extent of uh, China's size as an economy, but not only that, China's um, rapid growth. So averaging 9.4% over that period since 1978, um, not completely unprecedented in terms of uh, uh, that, that sort of speed, um, but this combination of scale and speed is what makes it unique. And that what I'm arguing is when you get to the kind of second half of this period into the 21st century, it's big enough to drive and shape global markets that previously were mainly driven by economies in the north, the G7 countries mainly. So by 2013, um, China's annual GDP growth is like adding a new Indonesia to the, the global economy every single year. Um, and at this point, even when Africa slowed, I think it's equivalent to Australia, uh, even today. And important about that as well is it's not the same as, say, that amount of growth coming from somewhere like the US. Because China is still a middle income country, uh, this is still resource intensive growth and incredibly resource intensive. So. Um, particularly after the 2008 um, crisis, you have this huge stimulus building of things like um, high-speed train uh, uh, lines. So rail lines in China, high-speed rail virtually none before 2008. Now it's, I think, about two thirds of the whole world's high-speed rail is in China. Um, and that point that I've already made before about the key turning point being in the early 2000s, and rising in, uh, quantities of imports needed despite significant domestic production. And I'm not gonna go through all the different sort of metals and minerals and things, but just to give you an example of what I'm talking about here. So the gray bars there are copper prices. And as you can see, along with many of the other commodities I look at, they move in a similar pattern. So you get a pickup in prices in the early 2000s, bit of a dip around 2009, comes back to even higher prices than it, it was previously, and then starts to fall off from around that 2013, 2014 uh, point. And if you look at um, the blue line there, that's G7 net uh, copper imports. Copper, by the way, used to be used as a forecasting tool for the health of the global economy generally because it's so widely used in different industrial applications and also things like consumer electronics as well, um, that it's seen as an indicator for global economic activity generally. And it was always driven effectively by uh, the health of economies in, in the global north, particularly G7 economies. And you see this inflection point here where both of those lines, the orange line is, is, is Chinese import, uh, both of these lines are rising to about 2006, but then it's clearly coinciding with uh, patterns in Chinese imports rather than Chinese seven imports. Obviously, alone, that's not enough to sort of prove this relationship, but it's one example. I think if you just look at the raw numbers of China's share of global consumption, it's hard to look at any of those and think, well, China's not a major driver uh, of these different commodities. So you've got copper, nickel, um, just say something about, I include soybeans. Um, uh, they're the one agricultural commodity I'm looking at in this context uh, because they um, behave in a slightly different way from say cotton or corn or whatever it may be. In that, um, what's happening in China around this time is that as uh, incomes rise, consumption of meat is increasing uh, a great deal. Um, and uh, uh, particularly pork. And um, what do Chinese pigs eat? Well, the stock that comes from soy, most of that soy being exported from the US, but also Argentina and, and Brazil principally. And because the structure of the soy industry is in some sense a bit more like an extractive industry than it is a agricultural industry. So highly mechanized, capital intensive, 
uh, very small uh, number of firms involved, high concentration, which means that, you know, a government like Argentina can tax it and use the, uh, the surplus in a similar way that it might do with something like oil. So that's why I'm including soybeans here. But again, you see that the, the share of um, uh, global consumption, the one that's lower, of course, here is oil. Um, but if you look at the, the lower um, uh, series of numbers there, you can see that in that decade, 2002 to 2012, um, China's uh, share of global consumption growth, even in oil, and bear in mind at this time, um, China's energy mix is still two thirds coal. Um, it's only about 20% oil. And yet even given that, it's still responsible in that decade for nearly half of global growth in that um, commodity. Now, copper and nickel, it's over 100%, which shows that actually it is compensating for um, a fall in demand uh, elsewhere in the world. So I think there's no question that, that China is the, the main driver here. Now, clearly there are other factors, uh, you know, India to some extent, some bits of Southeast Asia. Um, but I, I think that, you know, this is an empirical question. And you think it, it, it's clear that it's, it's China's the main ingredient here. And without China, um, this sort of boom would not have is what I'm going to argue at least. Right, so if you are going with me so far, how then do we get from commodity boom and commodity boom driven by China to this idea of increased development space, greater policy autonomy for this range of countries? Well, I make two claims here, right? So China driven commodity boom allows, but does not compel, so this is a necessary but not sufficient condition. Resource rich states to break with liberal economic orthodoxy. Um, I'm kind of using this and neoliberalism interchangeably. Don't want to get too far into the weeds about talking what I mean exactly by neoliberalism, but I will talk about it um, in summary in a moment. So my second claim then, whether a break occurs, so the, the space for a break to occur is created by the boom, but it doesn't mean that breaks have to happen. Whether those breaks then occur in a particular case and the form it takes depends primarily on domestic conditions, on the nature of state society relations in each case. And particularly within that, the nature and strength of the domestic capitalist class and the various fractions of it. So before the boom, what's happening? Because I, I want to argue really that prior to the boom for this group of countries, and remember I'm talking about Southern resource exporters that were highly indebted at this, this point. Um, for other countries, the conditions are rather different. You know, you do have various countries in the 70s and 80s that do stray certainly from the, the neoliberal molds, particularly, I mean, East Asia, China, right? But, but plenty of people as well. So I'm only talking about this set of cases here, but still, what I'm arguing is that the kinds of turns that we see during the commodity boom in this group of country would, would not have been feasible prior to the boom years. So what's happening? Well, I think that you have disciplined, uh, you know, you have policy constraints, you have policy discipline that comes from um, the outside. And what I don't mean by that is that it's simply about the IMF going around and imposing its will on different parts of the world. Um, certainly you have different domestic groups that favor these policies in each case. Uh, you have various forms of resistance and retrenchment and, and all that. And then, of course, with neoliberalism itself, there are various iterations of it. You have the structural adjustment programs and the, the Washington consensus. You have the post-Washington consensus and the sort of turn towards a, a, a concern with things like uh, border governance measures and institutions and the idea of poverty reduction strategy papers, reducing the old structural adjustment programs, those sorts of things. But fundamentally, there's a through line through all those things, I think, which is on a policy level, and this is how I'm analyzing it, basically commitments to privatization, liberalization, deregulation, um, as the broad governing principles around which uh, economic programs are, are designed. 
Um, and to just give, I mean, I give a couple of examples in the book. So, you know, Alan Garcia in, in Peru, his first presidency in the 1980s, uh, or, or uh, Zambia uh, in the late 1980s. So uh, take Zambia as, as the example here. Uh, in the late 1980s, there is a attempt to uh, uh, impose austerity um, because of, of debt problems. Uh, bring in the IMF and the donors to agree a uh, austerity program, and that includes the removal of subsidies from maize, which is the, the corn. So that's a staple food in Zambia. There are food riots, uh, major ones. The government uh, is sort of um, teetering on the edge. There's even a coup attempt. So uh, the government withdraws from the IMF program and instead relaunches a kind of uh, economically nationalist program called growth from own resources and and they try this for a couple of years and it actually works reasonably well for the first year or two but then after the imf pull out the world bank pulls out all the donors pull out and uh zambia is in real trouble economically without those external flows and therefore has little choice i mean there i'm not saying this is impossible that it had to go this way because you have the example uh, of um, Zambia's neighbours, Zimbabwe, right, which did take a different, more sort of isolationist course and survive, but there were grave consequences for that level of isolation from um, uh, the kind of mainstream of the global political economy. And you can think of other examples of it, this around the world of you know states that are uh, very cut off, um, and that's the sort of choice that, that was faced, I think. Um, so that through the 80s, through the 90s, through these levers of debt, through capital markets, through donors and relationships with donors, you have a continuing parameterization of acceptable policy, basically around those principles of privatization, liberalization, deregulation. But then you get the boom. And just as a you know, kind of illustration, this is terms of trade indices uh, with 100 uh, value being um, uh, indexed to the year 2000. And the, uh, the flat lines here are, so you have one which is the G7 countries, one which is food exporters. So again, differentiating agriculture here and then manufactured goods exporters, right? So their terms of trade as a group are, as groups are flat or even slightly declining. Whereas I have a sample of my, my cases here and nearly all of them to varying extents, but nearly all of them have this same pattern, right? Of a, a very, very positive uh, major terms of trade shock early 2000s, a dip around uh, 2008, 2009 for obvious reasons, and then a return to the boom which then tails off around 2014, 20, 2015. So that same basic shape. So again, my argument being that this is, is coming from um, Chinese demand ultimately. So the argument is that that terms of trade shock is the basis for, um, is the necessary but not sufficient condition for breaks with neoliberalism. So in these boom conditions. So what do I mean by a break? Well, a change in overall policy set or orientation, change in direction of travel. So I'm not talking about fixed points or endpoints. So, uh, you know, is this economy more or less liberalized than this one at, at the end of the commodity boom? It's, it's not about where they start or end, but um, the trajectory and whether that changes. A shift away, broadly speaking, from those three overall guiding principles. And I suppose in one way or another, that will involve more of a role for the state, uh, broadly speaking. I'm talking about more than resource nationalism. So resource nationalism is usually around um, uh, governments gaining more control one way or the other of their um, uh, resource industries. So increasing taxes, nationalizing, expropriating, those sorts of things. What I'm saying is that that's often a first step in this. Um, but if they do say up the royalty rates on their copper exports, as Zambia did, but then don't really change their policies uh, and exploit the space that they, they've got from that, then I don't count it as a break. And I mean, you know, if I'm looking at the various experiments that, that I sort of detail in the book, then certainly not all kind of um, coherently mapped out before the fact. A lot of this is improvised. 
but it's relatively what I'm talking about for a break is something that's relatively coherent as an agenda, not just the odd policy here or there. And I should also say as well that this isn't necessarily all celebratory, right? So some of these experiments might, might you know, have, have their own costs. And uh, particularly when we're talking about extractive industries, right? Um, you know, all of these involve a deepening and, and, and uh, intensification of extraction, which has major, major global costs, of course. Um, so I won't get into the, the methods too much, but I use qualitative comparative analysis, uh, 18 cases, and looking for that idea of resource dependency as a necessary but not um, sufficient condition for, for these, these breaks. And that's kind of a, in the end of the book, um, if you want to have a look at it. So how do I get to the, the, this typology then? So, so bear in mind that I'm not talking about a binary here. So it's not just going from neoliberalism to not neoliberalism. I think there's a few different kinds of break. And I also think there's, there's a, few, a couple of types of um, states um, where there are various different kinds of um, persistence of neoliberalism as well. So you think of it as a kind of escape hatch, the boom. So once you threw it, many different directions that, that you can take. Um, and I think there are five types of response that I see among my, my 15 cases. And those types are defined, I think, uh, by a pattern of state society relationship, particular one in each, each type, and a particular kind of political economic orientation which sort of fits with that. Three of these five represent breaks with liberal orthodoxy, and again, saying this is unfeasible before the boom, and two of the five represent forms of liberalizing continuity. And so that's my, of my 15 um, cases, that's my typology. Anything on the left side of there are, are what I define as breaks with uh, a neoliberalism or neoliberalization, and then two different kinds of continuity on the, the right there. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to be able to talk about all of these countries or even all of these types. So I will concentrate on those type, those breaks and go back and talk about donor driven orthodoxy and homegrown orthodoxy uh, once I finish, if you'd like to. But OK, so what what determines this? So to go into it a bit more detail, what direction uh, do breaks take and, and uh, what determines whether they occur? So in terms of domestic factors, I mean, dealt with that kind of the, the global level shift that I'm talking about that sets the, the landscape, if you like, over which these domestic dynamics play out. What are those domestic dynamics? Well, um, they present opportunities for various groups to control and direct state power that they might not have had before. And I think that the key element here, the first question to ask is, is there a large autonomous capital class in the country? And what I mean by that is a country in the world has a business class of some sort, has capitalists of one kind or another. Um, but what I mean by autonomous is that a, a domestic capitalist class, uh, which is um, its base of accumulation lies largely outside the state. So in many countries, lot of the lower income countries that I looked at, you take something like Zambia, if you take something like Angola, um, you have certainly there are, are, are businesses there, there are growing capitalist accumulation in various kinds of ways, but you tend to find that the, for the majority of at least the, the largest ones, they will not function without largesse from the state. So patronage relations of one kind or another, licensing, contracting, procurement, these sorts of things. And that's, that's the difference. Once there are uh, large capital groups that uh, can operate relatively autonomously of the state, I think that that changes the, the picture somewhat. So if there is an autonomous domestic capitalist class, um, then I think that the direction taken by, uh, by these countries seems to depend upon its unity and strength, so relative to other groups, and especially popular classes and movements of various kinds, and then the orientation of leading elements. So this is kind of the, you know, fractions capital stuff, um, where, whether it's financial and industrial capital, ties to transnational capital as well, 
Um, but I'm not, this isn't kind of back to the 70s deterministic sort of thing. Um, it doesn't have to be about um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, the, like the reading off mechanically their, their interests. So finance capital uh, is oriented to transnational capital, that sort of thing. Sometimes these are different groups of, of capital that are divided by history and geography, right? So very often in some of the Latin American countries, the Andean countries, you get a highland group and a lowland group. That it's not like it's a it's a fight between a national bourgeoisie and a a comprador bourgeoisie or anything like that. There are just historical rivalries that that mean that these these groups tend to um, fight it out with each other. Okay, and if you don't have that autonomous capitalist class, then my argument is well, actually, then it's primarily down to these for a box old term state managers so the, the the state itself and within that i think it depends on whether the country has a legacy of a dependence or not so the argument is if a state has uh, had uh, say a decade or, or more of uh, relying to a significant extent so about 10 percent of gdp on flows of aid from the global north um, then the argument is that uh, even though you have the resource boom, usually those in control of those states don't want to kind of risk those relationships and those, those flows and therefore don't divert from this kind of model that is, is uh, uh, agreeable to the donors. Whereas if you don't have that, so places like Angola and, and places like Kazakhstan, then there's more freedom for uh, governments in these cases to experiment. In, and go in a more sort of status direction. Okay, so I'll run through a couple of these fairly quickly. Maybe I won't get to talk about individual cases, but to talk about my, my, my three types uh, of break, because I realize everything I've just said seems very schematic and abstract. So let me put that in a slight more uh, specific terms. These are all ideal types, more or less. My first one is what I call neo-developmentalist type. So I think this is Argentina and Brazil. Here you have a relatively strong domestic capitalist class. But within that, what happens in the period of the boom is a new ascendance of, broadly speaking, domestic productive capital, but not a kind of necessarily national bourgeoisie, but kind of a capital that wants to compete at home and abroad. So the growth of things like national, national champions. Um, but the emergence of a political coalition uh, dominated by those interests, but also includes compromise with key groups from the popular classes. So in Argentina, I mentioned it right at the beginning, you have the Picateros, the movement of the unemployed. They become part of the kind of Kirchner uh, political machine in one way or another and the various uh, uh, concessions to labor and these sorts of things. So. Um, that sort of state society uh, configuration, I think, corresponds to a development model that, that appears in this, this era that's driven ideologically, uh, you know, it, it comes originally from uh, Brazilian uh, economists, it's quite a lot of Argentinian economists who, who follow it as well. You have in the wake of the, uh, you know, the economic collapse in the early 2000s, uh, you have this this uh, group called the the group of Phoenix uh, of economists that sort of meet and start to advise the the Kirchners on economic policy, and it's really about a reinvigoration of uh, uh, industry, national industry. This idea of applying the lessons of the import substitution uh, industrialization era into a global economy. Stress on competitiveness at home and abroad. They're including uh, industrial policy, but, but targeted. Uh, less emphasis on inflation as the main economic problem as there would be under the old kind of neoliberal approach. And some sense of sharing in the gains, right? So a bit like the old Fordist compromise of, um, you know, kind of a, a share for labor, a share for capital. Also share for not necessarily formal labor, but marginalized groups so you get the growth of things like cash transfer schemes and, and those sort of things but also higher wages okay so i'll skip over the details of argentina and go to the next type so this is another type of break what i call the extractivist redistributive type so here you get the three countries often considered the sort of the, the radical uh part of the pink tide um uh, i grouped them together for different reasons than many other people do i think 
What I'm saying here is that there is an autonomous capitalist class in all of these three cases, green boom, but it's weak or, or and or divided. So as I said, you know, you take Ecuador, you have a group uh, centered on, on Quito, the capital, uh, you have another group centered on uh, Guayaquil and the Pacific coast. Um, and uh, not necessarily a case of kind of productive capital versus financial capital or anything like that, um, but sort of quite a fractured landscape to different coalitions fighting each other to a standstill effectively and, and through uh, economic chaos that weakens them all. And the, the idea is here that the, that the, the sort of uh, wreckage of that presents an opportunity for uh, popular class groups of various stripes to sort of unify and, and take control of the state with the fact that you, you're in the middle of a resource boom, giving them access to resources which they can use and deploy in ways which they would not have been able to had they been dependent on an IFMF program, for example. And yes, there is a kind of populism associated with this, a kind of overhaul of uh, uh, constitutions and, and institutions and those sorts of things particular uh, style around majoritarianism and mobilization and referenda and those sorts of things. Increasing role of the state, um, but very somewhat, again, these are ideal types, it varies a bit, but limited diversification efforts. So it's less developmentalist than perhaps the, uh, uh, the neo-developmentalist uh, type that I, I talked about. More of a focus on redistribution, on social spending, on these sorts of things. Um, a, a big change in terms of the state take from resource extraction that allows them um, to, to do that. Um, and uh, yeah, so again, I'll skip over the details here. I'm just talking about my, my, my third kind of class of break here. So these are ones that I call the oligarchic extractivist type. So different from those first two types I've talked about, this is a kind of... Uh, a type where there isn't a, a significant autonomous domestic capitalist class, uh, relatively independent from the state. So Kazakhstan, for example, there's certainly powerful economic groups there, but the majority of them are, um, again, dependent on, um, on, on patronage networks that are, are tied to the central state. Um, and so I see more of a role for state managers here than I do for, for kind of capitalists. And the idea here is that kind of revenue flowing through the state outweighs any domestic accumulation so that um, you get a kind of public private sector differentiation is, is sort of blurred. It doesn't work the same as you would have it in a kind of uh, society dominated by um, uh, where there is this autonomous capitalist class, uh, the idea being that, you know, so for example, people around the presidential family will often own uh, the largest um, uh, companies. And in that sense, a bit like say the Gulf country, something like this, uh, the, the functions of, of um, being in control of a state owned enterprise and being in control of a company that you personally own are relatively blurred there. So the kind of the, the line between political and economic power is not, not clear. And therefore there's more of a, a role for the people who, who control the state in terms of both the politics and the economics of, of these societies. In these countries, and this is what differentiates them from the likes of say, say Zambia or, or Mongolia uh, or, or Laos, I argue, is that the, there is little history of aid dependence here. And therefore, I mean, if you take Angola, uh, you know, you have a very devastating civil war up until the um, early 2000s. Uh, normally what would happen at the end of that is that the, the donors would come in and, and uh, begin their programs of various kinds, which would have to you kind of cleave to that basic principles of, of liberal economic orthodoxy. But because there's a takeoff in, in oil revenue at, at that point, the Angolan state is able to actually say no to that and then sets off on its own different kind of course. You could contrast that to not resource export, or at least it wasn't at this time, but Mozambique on the other, other side of Africa, Portuguese colony, similar history of civil war, comes out of civil war at the same time and immediately launches into um, donor designed um, programs of, of various kinds. Whereas Angola goes its own way and is able to sort of say no to, for better or worse, 
to say no to this and embarks on much more of a sort of state driven um, uh, reconstruction efforts, focusing on things which actually now are relatively uh, um, orthodox in terms of, of development uh, programs. So particularly infrastructure, particularly rail in Angola's case. Um, but back then that would not have been a priority for say a World Bank program somewhere like Angola. Um, so you have this kind of harking back a bit to the old rentier state idea, sort of high modernist vision of, of development, state-led development, uh, the creation of new kind of bourgeoisie certainly, uh, but, but mixing that with um, uh, elements of predation. Okay, I see I'm getting questions, but I'll, I'll, I'll wait till the end. So let me just finish off quickly and realize I'm kind of um, running over a little bit here. But so what happens after the boom then? And I, I mean, it's kind of key, right? So you get the, the commodities bust around uh, 2013. Uh, you get a, 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 a slowdown um, in uh, the kind of the Chinese stimulus runs out of steam as an effort to to rebalance uh, and also there's a supply response in terms of exploration for new sources of these different uh, extractive um, industries. So new iron ore deposits, new oil wells, et cetera, et cetera. Those start to come online gradually through this boom period. And then, you know, there's a shift in supply demand dynamics, which means prices start to ease off. And this is of course a real problem for these um, states which have built their political economic experiments around um, boom levels of, of resource flows. And yes, it is a disaster. So you get a, a collapse in Venezuela, uh, overthrow of governments in, in Bolivia and Brazil, um, an electoral defeat uh, in, and, and the election of a, uh, you know, an avowedly neoliberal um, president in Macri in, in Argentina. Um, um, Ecuador, you have a kind of rollback, but under under kind of a the, the same party, Lenin Moreno takes over from Correa um, and shift back towards IMF agreements and these sorts of things. Um, Angola, there's a sort of softening and a, a turn towards the, the IMF, but but retains many of the elements of, of its uh, original model. And perhaps the one case where there is a degree of continuity in terms of the state led development model is, is Kazakhstan, where they're actually still engaging in counter cyclical spending in 2018 and, and uh, still pushing for this state led development um, project. Um, a lot of this is tied up to kind of rising levels of debt. And of course, that's got much worse again with the COVID crisis, which for many countries in the global south is. Um, a public health crisis, but also a, um, a a sovereign debt crisis, and in fact, that's what I'm working on right now. Um, and an increasing turn towards China as a creditor directly, uh, so borrowing from China to replace um, uh, the resource uh, um, uh, income. But perhaps we're getting some kind of shift back. And I think that this is where you get the lasting legacy of some of this stuff in that, you know, uh, Morales' party is back in power in, in Bolivia. Correa's party may well win in, um, in uh, Ecuador next year. Uh, you have Kirchner back as vice president with uh, Fernandez in, in Argentina. Um, and at least there is still, there is this kind of alternative in terms of political contestation, a political force that, that wasn't really a viable electoral alternative before, that at least is now. Now, the big question, of course, is what can those governments do in power without the resource revenues? And that we will see in the next year or two. And I agree with what Jan has just said, maybe IMF or Beijing is your choice. Um, so legacy, so of course, it's decidedly mixed. None of these models can really be uh, sustained without high resource prices. But, and again, I know Jan has, has issues with me on this, but I would compare it um, in terms of significance to the, the new international economic order. So that's the period in the 1970s where associated with a, a, a boom in particularly oil prices and some of the commodities as well, there is an effort by countries in what was called the third world that back then to kind of, um, to shift the, the, the terms of the, uh, 
their deal, essentially, the global economic deal. So a lot of influence of the old structuralist thinkers, the old Prebish Singer idea about commodity producers being disadvantaged and having little control over their prices. So you get OPEC as a cartel to set oil prices, partially successful. You get attempts to do similar with things like bauxite and sugar and coffee, which don't really work. Um, but you do get these ambitions about a, a, you know, kind of a shift in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the, the Saudi oil minister goes on TV and in the US and says, you will listen to us now. And there was a bit of a feeling about that. I mean, not that old. I wasn't around back then. But I, I think that, uh, you know, there was a bit of a feeling about that. Um, but, you know, it, it, after there was a bust in the 80s and a lot of those things disappeared and you got the debt crisis and Structural adjustment programs. So perhaps we're heading for something similar here. I don't know. But it is, I think, a depending on external conditions, yes. Um, but a moment where those constraints were loosened and that uh, whether successful or not, and, and whether they were for good or, or worse, that you get this assertion of sovereignty, of autonomy, of policy choice that's determined by national governments as opposed to. Um, you know, depending on discipline from uh, transnational uh, capital of one sort or another. And I, I think there is, you know, no simple return to business as usual now, even as I've said, not clear how it mixes with other global dynamics. What I am starting to think about more now is this idea that, as I said, you look at what Angola was doing in the early 2000s, and this seemed pretty crazy. But by now, that's relatively orthodox, right? So World Bank uh, documents or the G20 stress the idea of the infrastructure gap and funding for large infrastructure projects. Now, I've recently been reading Daniela Gabor's stuff about, she, she talks about this idea of the Wall Street consensus as the emerging development regime. So you have infrastructure, but it is funded by public-private partnerships and that concessional development finance is used to, I think it's Emma Mordi who talks about escorting capital to frontier markets and making Things like dams in a country like Ecuador, investable for uh, mutual funds or BlackRock or, well, asset managers of whatever kind. And of course, that means certain features of the old Washington consensus have to be there as well, because it's, you know, making the environment attractive to global financial capital. So that's one face of that. But you can also build infrastructure by, by borrowing money from China, right? So possibly you have this infrastructure. I mean, my colleague, Seth Schindler, uh, in Manchester writes about this, the idea of an infrastructure-led development regime that's emerging. And maybe the two faces of that are the Wall Street consensus and, I don't know, use an old term, the Beijing consensus, maybe. Um, but I guess we'll see. We'll see. But as I say, it seems like a critical time now. We have these debt negotiations. Zambia just defaulted on its debt. Ecuador defaulted on its debt. What is going to happen in terms of this? Are you going to get to a point where countries are choosing between Washington and Beijing? Uh, who knows? Uh, I'll just run through this very, very quickly because I've said most of that. So, you know, talked about neoliberalism. I mean, is it is it dying? Is it dead? Are we, you know, does it continue? Um, I, I guess I'd stress as well that for all the fact that I don't think any of the examples that I look at are can be termed unqualified successes, there are very, very few unqualified successes in terms of late development, let's say, and it's incredibly hard. Um, and I think we have to be a bit realistic about what we expect in terms of results over the period of, say, a decade. Um, I think we need to look to the, the future in terms of trying to anticipate what some of these larger shifts might be and the kind of, again, differential uh, kind of tightening and loosening of constraints that come with that for certain types of states and actors and maybe think about strategies of what to do in those cases. And then, of course, as I've already mentioned, I think a little bit, but the big sort of elephant in the room with all of this is that I'm talking about countries that rely mainly on extractive industries and particularly for fossil fuel exporters. What is the future when, you know, I mean, according to a lot of calculations, probably 80 percent of known deposits of oil have to stay in the ground if we're going to keep below 1.5 or maybe even two degrees heating. So what does that mean for Venezuela or Ecuador or, or even Saudi Arabia or Russia, right? Um, I think I'll leave it at that. But thanks very much for listening to me and even while I rambled on and went way over time, so thank you. 
Thanks so much, Nick. Um, I think part of the appeal of your approach is uh, that it goes outside of the Atlantic neighborhood and also that your argument is very multicentric. Different forces are in play. Thanks very much. Please, uh, floor is open. Mm. Oh, can I ask just a, a quick question? Um, well, first, I, I, I love the presentation. Thank you. It gets me uh, thinking about some of these and things in ways I hadn't before. Um, the whole time, and I'm not a Kazakh expert, but Kazakhstan just kind of stuck out to me in your analysis um, as something that like pretty much had kind of solidified its like oligarchic extractivist type, you know, by the mid to late nineties. And I don't really see how this commodity boom changed things except for slightly higher standards of living for most Kazakhs, more money into oligarch pockets, more mega projects. And yeah, even without the boom seems to be fine going ahead. Like uh, it, it just seems to be like the, you know, paradigm of continuity in a changing world. And I was just wondering if you could uh, like uh, explain a little bit what you meant by the, the change here. Sure. Maybe stop your share screen, Nick, then we can see your face. Oh, yes, of course. Sorry. Really. Yeah. yeah, let me do that. Um... Sure. Yeah. So do you want me to answer one by one or should I collect a few? Or... Up to you. OK, well, I, I guess I'll answer. I mean, OK, I have to admit that Kazakhstan is not my speciality either. I but. From what I can tell, the, the shift I think in Kazakhstan comes, there's an inflection point around sort of 2007 or so, as far as I know. And uh, I mean, there's, there's the, the big discovery of a gas field around that time and the kind of that coming online. But then also a shift to more of a statist model in the sense of, um, uh, in a bit of a different way in some respects. So you have the growth of sovereign wealth funds and these sorts of things and the idea of a a, a kind of, you know, I guess you compare it, I mean, it's modeled on Singapore particularly, I suppose, but compare it to that Chinese sort of East Asian model or they sort of, people like Adam Dixon talk about state capitalism, right? So not statist in the sense perhaps of a um, non-commercially oriented or non-market oriented, uh, you know, kind of, um, uh, um, state complex of state-owned industries but the idea of the state as the uh as market creator and participant both home and abroad and i, I think that you do see a bit of a, a shift in in that respect and a, a change in trajectory in terms of um you know you you get kazakhstan's by no means the most sort of liberalized of the the former um uh soviet republics uh, but it's by no means a sort of least liberalized either. And that there is a broad trajectory of kind of gradual privatizations and these sorts of things, I think, uh, until that period around the sort of mid to late uh, 2000s, when you do get this bit of a reversal and a shift towards more stated development planning around mega projects and these sorts of things. Now, I think that that actually has changed a little bit in the last couple of years. I think there is a bit more of a turn towards this PPP model and, and all that kind of stuff. But that's essentially where I see the inflection point. It's not necessarily about different factions uh, gaining power within Kazakhstan, so much as it is them kind of maybe shifting the mode of accumulation to some extent. There's more, more. Um, I mean, you can always make an argument that does it really matter whether something is private or, or public in a country like that in some respects. But there, there seems to be more facility for them to shift towards more avowedly um, status model. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I also would like to uh, raise a question uh, more maybe on the theoretical side. So let me first of all say what I really liked about uh, your typology and approach to what you looked at is um, that there is more diversification of, of concepts in order to understand these rent seeking behaviors, right? I mean, a sort of a similar discussion there was already in the 70s, 80s the late dependencia about rent seeking state class, but it was always very monolithical. Now there's a spread. Uh, that's what I really like. And now I come of course to the point where I'm a little bit unsatisfied yet 
and it also relates to the question I posed in the in the chat. Um, does it even matter from your theoretical um, framing that it is China where the demand emerges for these primary goods, right? If it would be in the US or in Europe or wherever, uh, where there would be all of a sudden a huge demand for, for copper, all the same sort of agency would occur uh, in, in all these different countries you looked at. And, and I was wondering uh, if it's only a matter of timing or if it's indeed maybe a matter of the theory not yet opening up enough to understand also the socio-cultural implications that are there with the, with the emergence of China as a global player. Mm. Well, so I, I think that that's a good point. I mean, I, I think that, you know, it, it adds, this is always an unsatisfying answer, but it's always impossible to do everything, right? Um, so trying to look at socio-cultural implications across 15 cases would have been a uh, tall order on top of what I've, what I've been doing. But I think, I mean, I, I agree to some extent, right? So I, I suppose what I'm trying to say is I haven't talked a lot about the direct impacts of China here because they think that lots and lots of other people do that. And as I say, I'm, I'm starting to, to do that more myself as well. Um, but particularly when I started writing this. So, I mean, this started as a PhD project in like 2011. Uh, uh, Particularly then, there was starting to be quite a lot of literature about, you know, China and Africa or China and Latin America, China and Cambodia, something like that, which was all about, uh, you know, investments in, in, in oil and loans for oil and what about Chinese workers and these sorts of things, right? So there was a recognition about the rise of China and that being important in one way or another. And uh, I mean, I mentioned the, the Beijing consensus, I think that the original article came out in 2004. Um, but what I was trying to point to was that there is this indirect sort of second order effect that is about China's impact on kind of uh, shaping the global political economy in a way that warps it so that conditions and con uh, um, uh, constraints change for different locations within that, that, that global economy. Now, I think that, that you know, does it matter that it's China or somewhere else? In those pure terms, no. But then it couldn't have been anywhere other than China because, you know, the story of China's emergence as workshop of the world and all this depends on particular conditions that were present in China at the end of the Maoist era. And then, I mean, Ho Feng Hung talks about it as kind of uh, bringing together the two sides of the Cold War, right? So you have the, the Maoist period, which for all its uh, brutality in many ways has a legacy of, uh, essentially a very large population of uh, relatively highly skilled, relatively highly educated, relatively healthy workers on very, very low wages. Um, and that bringing in then um, uh, diaspora uh, investments from Taiwan and from the rest of Southeast Asia, where you've already had uh, kind of the take off the Asian uh, tiger economies, spreads those networks into China and China has this, uh, you know, huge capacity to um, um, uh, take up, uh, you know, th that, that production just because it's population and, and the particular advantages it has around that, that sort of, uh, 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 th those manufacturing processes and, and then building from there. So it's very hard to think of a counterfactual story where it's say India that plays this role, I think, because the, the uh, the economy is just just configured very differently. Now, that's not to say that there's not a future where something like this happens and it's you know a configuration of Southeast Asian countries or it is India or it's Nigeria or we we don't know. But I, I think that what I would say as well is that this sort of um, you know eight percent growth a year, say in a country with an economy the size of China. If that was a, uh, you know, quote unquote advanced country like the US or, you know, if it's the European Union or something, you don't get the same level of commodity demand because the, the, uh, the economic growth is coming from different sectors and it's more service led. Um, and that's also true of something like India, for example. So in that sense, it matters that it is China, but it doesn't. You know what I mean? It, it matters that it's China because of the particular type of economy that China was or is, but then it couldn't have been any other kind of, of economy that would have driven these processes. So 
I realize that's not much of an answer, but hopefully you see what I'm getting. Um, but I, I think in terms of social cultural implications, there's yeah, great deal of work to be done on this. That it's yeah, important stuff. Shinder, please. Your sound. Hi, hi Nick. Thank, thanks very much for a uh, uh, very interesting talk. Um, I, I, I must admit, you know, I've never thought about looking at the impacts of commodity booms or bust in terms of uh, looking at typologies of different different regimes, etc. Very, very interesting. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I just had two questions. One actually uh, is related to what you were just talking about in the previous question. Um, you mentioned this is the longest commodity boom, I think, historically. Uh, so, so, so the question that arises is, why did it prove to be the longest? And I'm just conjecturing, you know, was it just China or was it also India? I know India is a different type, but, but the Africa-India relationship, Africa, uh, India, China, Latin American relationship, uh, you know, they've all, they all blossomed in this period. Mm -hmm. So maybe, you know, the, the uh, commodity booms, uh, trade boom, maybe there's something there to keep this boom going. Uh, so I'd like to uh, sort of have, have, have your thoughts on that. Uh, the second one is, uh, you know, this, this idea of, uh, you, you looked at um, the impacts of the boom in different sort of regimes. And um, I'm just wondering what the impact is going to be now that there's been a massive decline in oil prices uh, and it's, going, it's likely to continue uh, for a long time. Uh, in, in, in some of your examples, you know, where, where the countries are oil exporting, oil dependent countries, mm -hmm. you know, we, we know the disaster that's already happened in Venezuela. But what's like? What's likely? What do you think is likely to happen? Uh, how does that change? Maybe you know the, the impacts may be uneven when there's a boom, when there's a bust. So I'd like to have your views on that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. I mean, uh, uh, two important questions certainly. I mean, I, I think in terms of the, the first one, so um, on whether it's just China. I mean, it's not just China, but I, I think that obviously that's an empirical question. I, I think, uh, you know, I, I showed a couple of slides there, but there's a, there's more in a book empirically about trying to establish that, you know, China is the, the, the dominant force here. Uh, you know, I mean, there are other countries that are growing fast at the same time, and there are others that look a little bit like China in terms of um, resource intensiveness. So, you know, somewhere like Vietnam, for example, but I mean, it's, you know, Vietnam's what? 70, 80 million people, so I'm kind of guessing, is that yeah. right, is roughly? Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. The, versus China. I mean, the way I put it is that if you look at the kind of increase in resource uh, usage, which, or energy, energy uh, usage, so that's the kind of the proxy for it, the rise of China around that commodity boom period is roughly similar to kind of what South Korea was doing in the 1980s. But it's, I don't know, like 30 South Koreas all growing up at that speed at once, um, which is obviously going to have a major impact on the, the global economy. Now, there are other countries as well, of course. I mean, Southeast Asia to some extent, India to some extent. India is different because it's more sort of self-sufficient as an economy. It's less export oriented. It's less, you know, depending on it, imports. That, of course, is changing a bit. And yes, you, you're absolutely right. You know, you have... Um, more Indian interaction with India, uh, with uh, with African countries, oil interests, those sort of things, and um, but but there isn't that sort of thirst for resources that you see uh, in in the Chinese case. I think it, you know there, there's an. I'm trying to remember who wrote it. I think it's Humphrey, maybe I can't remember. I'll I'll check this. But there's actually an article uh, a couple of years ago saying, well, you know, which is asking the question, is there another China? Are we going to, is there something else coming that's going to save community markets? And their conclusion is probably not, um, but that it doesn't mean that you necessarily go back to, I mean, you, apart from oil prices, things like metals are actually higher than they were, you know, in the early 2000s still now. So it's not a complete bust in that sense. Uh, but compared to the kind of levels of revenue that countries have got used to, it's, it's very difficult to sort of replace that. I think that what might happen possibly is that maybe you get booms in different kinds of commodities. So uh, one of the, you know, you have this, this 
you know, many, many years in China is talk about rebalancing. So the idea of shifting the economy towards more domestic consumption and away from um, depending on export orientation. Um, it's always been a very difficult needle to thread that. But the latest incarnation of that is this um, dual circulation idea um, that, that, that the Chinese media are pushing quite a lot at the moment, which is just another version. But if consumption keeps going up in China, then maybe you get different kinds of as incomes rise, you get more consumer good consumption, maybe you get uh, more demand for things like bauxite, which makes uh, aluminium, aluminum, uh, they, these sorts of things. Or maybe something like, you know, you get a shift of electric cars, maybe lithium. I know the Bolivians are very keen on that as a, a developmental bet. And are trying very hard to find a partner that will help them to actually manufacture the batteries in, in Bolivia as opposed to exporting the raw material. So maybe that's a kind of out. I mean, in terms of, you know, how do countries like oil exporters deal with this? I've, I've just been writing something right now, actually, on Ecuador. And, and you know, this maybe speaks to what Jan was, was saying, uh, one of the questions in the chat about social spending in ER. So that's the uh, extractivist redistributive. So places like Ecuador and Venezuela. Inclusive development oriented does an alternative paradigm uh, take shape. Well, actually, Ecuador was very ambitious about this. So what they tried to do was um, build a, a lot of large dams that would then replace their reliance on, on crude oil, on uh, refined oil, which they were importing, even though a crude oil exporter. And then also, and this isn't particularly, you know, good environmentally, but, it, but you know, it's an alternative, is they were trying to intense, you know, like open it, open up copper mines and things like that as an alternative to oil. They thought of that as a kind of bridging strategy towards uh, kind of um, a, you know, model of what they call sort of knowledge based production. So there was a, a big bet on the uh, planned city that they, they were building called Yachai in, in about 100 kilometers north of, of Quito which is going to be a city, but also a university and a science park and an industrial park and sort of semi-modeled on a career model. But they were looking around and they thought, well, I mean, it's it's really based in the kind of neo-structuralist, new structural economic stuff that just in Lin thing about finding possible comparative advantages and, and, and following them rather than, you know, that idea of the Harjun Chan thing about, you know, if Korea had stuck to its original comparative advantages, it'd be still a rice exporter at the moment. So how do you identify what, what possible comparative advantages your country could generate? And their answer, surprisingly, was biotechnology. So they looked and they said, well, what have we got? We've got one of the highest levels of biodiversity in the world. We've got a lot of kind of indi indigenous knowledge of different remedies and plants and these sort of things. So we'll start to kind of get a repository of these, map the genomes, apply them to pharmaceuticals, all that kind of stuff. Was the idea, and it, it, it didn't work, honestly, um, partly because Korea left power, but partly because, uh, you know, they had no industrial base for this. So it was a question of, of you know, taking the uh, genetic information and selling it on to, to global pharmaceutical companies. But I, I guess that's the thing is you, what, what you've got to find something right to, to replace oil and what's that going to be and I mean I guess you look at somewhere like Saudi Arabia and they have various efforts in, in this regard but I, I think it's a bleak future for many of these countries quite honestly. Mm. Mm. I see Swarupa has a, has a question too. Yeah. Uh, hi, thank you very much for the talk. My question might have been partially answered but I was wondering you know, with China's increasing focus on green technology or green investment, um, even though in the short run, green investment might support commodity prices, especially for oil, but in the long run, I was thinking, how would you say the relationship between China and these um, countries, especially in, the Latin, in Latin America, would change because of this increasing focus on green investment technology? Thank you. I mean, again, it's a very good question. You do have some uh, some projects in Latin America. I mean, Ecuador, there's a, a wind farm and, you know, the, the various attempts to, to kind of do this to, to some extent. I, th I think the issue is, I mean, this is more a question of sort of um, direct Chinese involvement. So things like like loans, particularly. Right. So I mean, typically that would be the, 
the pattern of you want to, you know, build a, a wind farm or whatever, and you would borrow money from China to uh, say China Development Bank to do that, and then um, they uh, you would contract a Chinese firm to build your, your um, solar park or your wind park or, or whatever it may be, and that's certainly happening. And there's obviously been a big, in, uh, you know, industrial policy push in China. Are you kind of now world leaders in these industries for absolute sure and there's no way that you know catastrophic climate change is going to be avoided without chinese involvement heavily all over the world but there are you know kind of um internal dynamics here in china as well and there are kind of interests in the old sort of smokestack industries and fossil fuel industries and there also is still that that kind of flexibility for better or worse around Chinese loans and what they are going to be used for. So if you're a country that's relatively strategically important to China and you want to build coal plants, then they'll lend you the money. I mean, Pakistan, right? Like they're building dams and they're building uh, solar panel plants and things like that. But because the Kazakhstan, uh, Pakistani government uh, you know, one of their priorities was to reduce the uh, import bill for fossil fuels, wanted to use their own resources of coal. Um, then, yeah, well, there was a the deal done as part of um, CPEC to uh, build uh, coal plants there still. And China's building coal plants in the Balkans, for example. Um, so it's, it's hard to know, uh, you know, again, I think this, these are struggles that are going to be played out. And there is hope there for sure in the sense that the capacity is there and the capital is there to do it. Um, but it, it depends on, you know, it's it's not the, the, the pieces don't fall into place that, that easily. There's got to be a, a fight to come over this, I think. Do you want me to go back through the, the comments now? I don't know if I've... Uh... Zeg, uh, Nick, uh, uh, please do, uh, just a, a practical note on my side. At two o'clock, I'm starting a class. So I okay. leave this <laughs> with cordial thanks to you. Very interesting. I leave this uh, five minutes before two. So I can I can eat something. No, sure. I don't want to keep it. I've been going on for long enough. <laughs> No, no, please but, uh, take up some of the questions if, if, if you want to. I have another question, uh, one or two. Say, uh, Parakana's book, The Future is Asian, uh, gives a, 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 a new angle, argues that China is actually embedded in greater Asia. Uh, there is a, a great dynamic uh, unfolding there. And this shift from China to Asia, and maybe that comes after the boom. There are some sub booms because of Asian business um, proliferating. That's an interesting angle. It's a bit business centric, not development centric. Um, and then my other question is, Nick, how much of this is transformational. Of the five types, only two represent breaks, and the breaks have been partial and, and, and have uh, folded in the, in the meantime. Does it matter that the Washington era, Cold War era, Washington consensus was deeply ideological, um, strongly uh, advocated and endorsing one particular model market oriented to go to, whereas China's role is now is non ideological. We do infrastructure, we do engineering, we do belts and we do roads, etc., uh, etc. Et mm -hmm. And so it is relatively silent. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, on the transformational question, I think clearly the fact that, um, you know, the, these are relatively temporary, so you, you get a decade. But having said that, I think that the, the test for me is, is simply this, is, you know, can you imagine something like a Rafael Correa in Ecuador at any time in the previous 40 years? And I think absolutely not. I think in, in kind of, you know, the mid-90s, the idea of a sort of left populist slash developmentalist government 
coming to power and, and uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, imposing a 99% windfall tax on foreign oil companies or something like this is just impossible. Um, so transformational in terms of change of direction of trajectory, I, I think. And I think that, you know, you look something like the pink tide is a, a really, you know, historically important trend in, in Latin America, for, for example. And that also some of the other the others, I mean, something like Angola is very, very studied. And in fact, seems more like a kind of herald of things to come now in a way. But I, again, at the time, it, it seemed utterly bizarre that a country that had just emerged from a civil war was not engaging with the World Bank and spending Chinese money and oil money to build railroads and uh, and, and these sorts of things. So I, I, your transformation in terms of long-term effects, perhaps not, but I think that's an incredibly high bar, frankly. Um, I, but I think there will be legacies that, that go on longer and this idea about mini booms and these sorts of things. I mean, that's the point I'm trying to make about trying to use this as a case study perhaps of global economic transformation. So the transformation really is China and the impact on the on a global political economy, but then the kind of the waves that ripple out from that and what the kind of second, third, fourth order effects of, of these are. And then what should we expect in future of, of you know, the, the kind of these different little booms and, and busts also, which are opportunities for, for some. Um, in terms of ideology, Washington model, these sorts of things, I absolutely agree with that. And I think that this poses a question for China now, though, and, and for, for, for the US and for the IMF and for, for the G20 is you now have these two, you know, it's developed enough now China's economic cooperation with the rest of the world in terms of particularly lending and, and project work and these sorts of things, um, that it is almost a rival, you know, a different kind of set of structures of international financial governance let's say so you can go to china development bank for a loan when you might have gone to as in fact the sri lankan government very recently said we are borrowing from china development bank because we don't want to go to the imf and all their conditions but does that you know china does not seem very keen to be the lender of last resort yet and if it wants to be then it needs to make decisions about uh, you know, if you're going to do that, then you have to have some way of making sure your creditors pay you back. And the IMF does that through demanding austerity and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so what does China do about this? You know, and there's various, this is where you get these, and it's very overblown, but there's this idea of like debt trap diplomacy and all that, that, well, China will, instead of insisting on payment back through austerity and then diverting tax money to to creditors that they'll insist on an equity share in the port that they just built for you or all these kind of things and i i think that that's you know not in the necessarily in this kind of predatory way but i think that's one possible way of that this shakes out i mean i heard with laos for example that the the debt deal they did there is for um uh effectively the a certain percentage of electricity company revenues will will go to china and they'll have a stake in the national grid there in land. Um, so that's the kind of implication perhaps of partnering with China on these things. Partnering with, uh, you know, kind of, let's say US or Global North centered uh, multilateral organizations like the IMF or, or whatever has a different implication, which is still this ideological thing. And I think that has shifted again a bit. I do kind of agree with Gabor's idea of the Wall Street consensus, I think is the best model yet we've seen about what kind of of regime might be emerging here uh but yeah it's not quite the same as washington consensus but i think that's a big part of it but then you have you know at the moment lots of countries in huge amounts of debt not sure how what to do uh to get out of it they owe china they owe the imf they owe, owe bondholders because they have completely different conditions and modalities it's very hard to come to a settlement so either that gets gets solved and it gets put together as one system or it breaks apart and you get something like maybe even a cold war right two different blocks i don't know <laughs> i have further i have further questions nick like now add the variable of rapid well considerable american decline and also uh, non non participation in so many uh, trade pacts and so on and so forth. But I'm 
Thanks. I must slip out now. Brett, do you want to round off the uh, uh, the final part, part, please? Thanks, folks. I mean, I guess we're, we're coming up on two o'clock now. So if, if there's any last questions, you know, um, feel free. Otherwise, um, otherwise, yeah, we could we could also end it. Go ahead. What what would the case study of most interest uh, you be for the next five years to look at? Where do you think the most interesting things would be uh, observable in, in terms of China's emergence? I'm trying to figure that out at the moment, quite honestly. Uh, I, I think that, you know, I mean, the work I'm doing at the moment, as I say, is around sovereign debt and, you know, what basically what happens when countries can't pay China back, because we know what happens when they can't pay the IMF back. But what you know, China's never run into this problem before, really. So, good countries that are, have a high level of debt and are struggling with that. So, so I mean, Ecuador was one. Uh, you know, I mentioned Sri Lanka. In fact, had it not been for the pandemic, I would have gone. Well, I was going to go to Sri Lanka, Kenya, and Montenegro. I feel was my idea, um, but because I'm starting to look more at Europe now as well, as well, because I think that Eastern Europe is quite an interesting area in that regard. Yeah, Hungary is uh, very actively looking for Chinese business. Yeah, um, Orban uh, classified the uh, the loan contracts, right? Yes. Right. <laughs> is that happening though, the, uh, the, the, the railway, the Belgrade Budapest, that's still happening or? The, the circle ends. Uh, we started with the Nicaraguan Canal. Now we're talking about yeah. the train going from London to Beijing. <laughs> <Who knows? laughs> sure, I guess we'll see. we'll see. But yeah, thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, I guess, so I will, I guess one last thing. Let me just put my email in the in the chat and then if I do this. Okay. Great. So thank you all uh, for coming and listening. I appreciated the question and uh, questions. And Brett, thank you very much uh, for organizing and pass on my uh, thanks to, to Jan again. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thanks, Nick, for your talk. Um, uh, next week, uh, we have uh, Adalberto Cardoso, who's going to be talking about um, COVID-19 response patterns in Brazil and South America, If um, and everyone is invited. So, all right. Thank you. My Thank you, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>